Hi, everyone. Um, so thanks for having us this morning. Uh, it sounds like Yuri's spending $100 million to find uh, aliens, and we have one here. Um, <laughs> an alien of extraordinary ability. Um, m most of you probably know a little bit about Vitalik. I'm not going to go through his whole bio. That's what Google's for. But just as a quick, uh, interesting background or, or note, I, I discovered cryptocurrencies in 2013. And for me, they were a, a brain virus is kind of the best way to describe it. When you first understand the concept, it's sort of all you can think about. And uh, in the four years subsequent, all I managed to do was invest a little bit here and there, write a little bit about it, and just try and understand it. Uh, in that period of time, in late 2013, Vitalik, uh, very young at the time, 18, 19, how old were you? When I created Ethereum? Yes. Yeah, 19. 19 years old. Uh, conceived of the project, tried to build it on top of master coins, spun it out as his own thing, uh, and created what is the most exciting uh, project in the space since Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever that is, originally created Bitcoin. Uh, and as you all hopefully know, it's a platform for distributed applications uh, in a trustless, secure, decentralized way. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what that means. We'll try and keep it very high level because I understand this is a general audience. Um, but yeah, without further ado, here, here's Vitalik. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about Ethereum. So please give him a big welcome. Maybe we'll just start very high level. In your own words, how would you describe Ethereum to the average person, why it's important? Yeah, so I mean, first of all, there's two kinds of average people. There is the average person who has already heard of Bitcoin, and there's the average person who hasn't. Right? So I mean, for the first category, it's a bit easier, because if you understand what Bitcoin is, and you understand that it's a peer-to-peer -peer digital currency, and you understand that if you want to have a digital currency that's decentralized, then the, like, you need some kind of database to store how much money everyone has. Right? Like if I have 100 you know, digital Bitcoin uh, dollars or digital whatever, or, you know, cash, and I send 100 to you, and I also send the same 100 to someone else, then those are two transactions, either one of which is illegal by itself, but both of which are illegal in combination because they'd be turning 100 units of cash into 200. And this is the classic double spending problem, and in order to solve it, you basically need to have some system that keeps track of, you know, have these coins already been spent? How much money do I actually have at any given time? How much money do I have the right to spend at any given time? And you can very easily do this with a centralized server, but if you want to do this in a way that's decentralized, which is you know, Bitcoin's original point in the spirit of things like BitTorrent, you know, you, it's actually a very hard computer science pro problem to figure out how to do it. And Satoshi Nakamoto probably came up with the first solution that you know, really is practical in this kind of open permissionless context, which is you know, the Nakamoto blockchain. And that was where you know, the idea of blockchain technology in general came from. Now, where Ethereum comes from is uh, basically you take that idea, the idea that you can use what I call crypto economics, so a combination of cryptographic algorithms, things like hashing and, and digital signatures, and the kinds of economic incentives that keep systems like Bitcoin going, and use them to create these kind of decentralized networks with memory, so these kind of decentralized database-like things for a whole bunch of other applications as well. Right? So around 2013, people started realizing really that these blockchains are usable for much more than peer-to-peer -peer digital currency. And the first major thing aside from Bitcoin was probably Namecoin, which was trying to do a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized DNS. But then people started thinking, you know, can you do other kinds of digital assets? Can you do smart contracts? Can you do financial agreements? Can you do uh, you know, registries about identity? Can you do all these other things? And there were so many applications that building a blockchain for each one doesn't really work. And so the core idea behind Ethereum is, you know, you can have a general purpose blockchain. We can have a blockchain where instead of the blockchain working like a Swiss Army knife, where you have, you know, five different tools for five different categories of applications, you have a blockchain that understands a general purpose programming language. So, you know, kind of like your phone, you know, in your phone you have Android or, you know, iOS. And inside of Android or inside of iOS, you can have apps. The apps are written in you know, whatever programming language they're written in. Anyone can create an app. Anyone can download an app and run it. So that was the kind of general purpose flexibility I was trying to bring to the, uh, bring to the blockchain world. 
Yeah, it's amazing. The, the concept of a Turing complete blockchain in, in the computer science speak that can execute any arbitrary program given enough resources uh, is pretty incredible. And it seems daunting because the idea of a blockchain is that everybody, uh, one of the uh, I implementations of blockchain is that everybody executes a copy of the code on themselves to verify that what is supposed to happen actually happens. So that begets a whole slew of problems like scaling and trust and, uh, and, and so on. But just kind of uh, easing into that, what kind of applications do you think an Ethereum blockchain is suited well for? Like the applications you both have people building today and ones in the future? Yeah, so I think there's in a few major categories. So, I mean, anything to do with like uh, the currency itself is obviously going to be a major category pretty much forever. Because and you want the security associated. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, like currency seems to be naturally the kind of application that's fairly well suited because, like, the general way that I categorize like block applications that are good blockchain applications is to think of what a blockchain is, right? So the way I define a blockchain is it's a decentralized system that contains some kind of shared memory. And, you know, in Bitcoin's case, the shared memory is how many Bitcoins everyone has at some time, but it could be anything. So a good blockchain application is an application that, number one, needs decentralization, and number two, needs some concept of shared memory. And, you know, the case for decentralization in uh, cryptocurrencies themselves, I think, is fairly clear, but you can actually even go beyond that, right? You can think about, you know, if you have decentralized um, a cryptocurrencies, then you, you, know, you can build many other things on top of them.